Hello there, welcome to a Second Thoughts overview of Nikari of Slanesh. I played the initial turns, got a feel for the faction, and I'm ready to talk about how they play a little. In the end, I'll have some army compositions for you to use in your campaigns for some fun. Now, this is not a full guide, but it will certainly help you out. So let's start with Nikari, shall we? For our short campaign victory, we'll need to destroy the factions of Avalorn, the factions of Eatain and the Vres, and then to control the following settlement, which is just the Shrine of Assyrian, located here. We also need to occupy Loot Razor's second 35 different settlements. Achieving this, we get Winds of Magic to all armies, good especially to Slanesh that relies a bit on magic. In terms of the long campaign victory, it's about achieving the short victory, occupy Loot Razor Sack 80 different settlements, and then I'll save you up. It's to control the whole island, basically. Achieving this will give us plus 10 Lord Recruit rank to all provinces. A decent reward, of course, to continue into domination or other objectives. Now, this is quite a straightforward campaign. Conquer the island. After which, you can do anywhere. So, it's it has a little bit of uh, a path that you need to follow and then some replay value as you can go anywhere you wish with different enemies. Now, Nakari is the Ox Tempter. So, he benefits from more allegiance points gained, more diplomatic relations with all factions and double tribute from vessels. All in all, benefits a lot from alliances and vassals. And in terms of climate, he does not like the desert or mountains, for instance. Of course, magical forests and jungle as well. Which, it's not excellent, but it still makes it a good faction to take over the world. As you can see here, in terms of climate, most areas are actually green and yellow. So, at least that helps, and not a lot of red uh, over the, only over there. So that helps ensuring that he the benefits from those. Note that it's not frozen, it should be desert here. It's just a template that I can use for all of these. It's basically, the the the, the uh, penalties are always the same. At least I think they are. So your starting location is right in the middle of the High Elves and with a lot of enemies nearby. Now, a three settlement province and you start on a minor settlement the typical expansion always goes into controlling Ulthwan of course either you go on this way or you go in that way that's really not too much uh, but yeah uh, the mechanics of the faction will soon grant you some allies some vassals so there's not too much to be said about it in terms of enemies because everything can change with with Slanesh that's for sure In terms of diplomacy, it is different than other chaos factions. You can actually get alliances with the very factions you wish to destroy later on. Now, hell, elves, uh, human, and beastmen factions are vulnerable to, to seductive influence, so they are most likely your outposts will include them. So, it is difficult to speak about who your enemies are. Of course, high elves is a given, but even they will become seducted, you know? So. Let's talk more about outposts. What outposts? It's probably good to have some missiles, some artillery, because you lack those. So, probably I would have something like the Dark Elves, you know, some good missile units, uh, good infantry based. And then we have the Empire, maybe you get some missile units, some artillery there, that would be nice as well. And maybe some High Elven as well. Of course, you can always try to have some minor High Elven faction to... to become your vassal. That's the sort of idea here. But yeah, it's certainly one faction that I could, that you can change how the world goes just because of the diplomacy, how it works. So, devotees is your currency, used to create cults, to spend on pleasurable acts or unholy manifestations, as well as generating some uh, disciple uh, armies as well. Now, let's talk about all of those. So, pleasurable acts first, they're very simple. You can use up the 2000 gold and devotees to get 50% more growth and control, or you can get more control and recruitment costs, less recruitment costs there, or you can get some more income from all buildings. So all with their different costs. Note that this one costs 50 control, by the way. So it's not really uh, really well noticeable, but yeah, it costs 50 control for more income. 
So good for like a secondary edit in, in essence, right? Now you also have the gifts of Slanesh. So any army that you fight, I didn't achieve this in, in the first few turns that I was trying. So any army that you fight can receive the gift of Slanesh, a trait basically. That lord will suddenly uh, spread Slanish corruption and generate devotees for you, and also the providing line of sight to you, which is excellent. You know, if they retreat and they go around everywhere spreading corruption, that's always nice, by the way. Now, you also can create uh, disciple armies. You can see the cost there. I already created one. And this is the army that it was created. They have some... Uh, 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 a trait that never goes off, which is that they constantly take attrition unless in high areas of Slanish corruption. None of your units will ever replenish and minus 20 uh, devotees per turn, which is still excellent. It's it's just generating a new army to overcome someone's, uh, someone's army or settlement. It's really cool. A nice uh, tactic that you can use up uh, your devotees to just, you know, get some reinforcements on the spot. You also have the Unholy Manifestation, so Painful Pleasure, pretty much campaign movement range, speed, weapon strength, charge bonus, good ones, but all units take 6% damage, be wary of that. You also have the Carnival of the Damned, by the way, all of these are in to, in terms of the, the full, the amount of Slanish corruption in the world, so the more, the better manifestations you can can have. So this one would give you devotees and less growth to the local enemy province. Then we ha can have the Infernal Martyrdom for Seduce Units budget plus 100% and Slanesh Corruption plus 8. And then we can have a Disciple Army that we summon near this army each turn. This one is crazy. So you'll have your Disciple Armies just rampaging that area uh, while your army cannot move. Uh, so, But yeah, Still, you'll have more than enough to deal with whatever. So, uh, useful in many circumstances and quite interesting as well. Now, let's talk about these proliferate cults. You can also spend devotees to send out three cults anywhere that, you know, they'll be randomized, by the way. So, we do have one here. I'll just skip the turn and come back so that I can show you because I would like to destroy this building. And then show you all the buildings that you can get here. So, we can have a seduce units cost reduced in the local province, devotees 5 per turn, that's awesome, and seductive influence. More on that in just a few moments. We can also have more diplomatic relations with the settlement owner and more seductive influence. And then we can have more seductive influence, I believe it always gets. And we can have a, a cultist hero, they'll be summoned if a capacity is available, and then it adds more capacity for cultists. And we also can get a disciple army that will be summoned near the settlement. Of course, the cult is destroyed upon the building's completion, but this is interesting. It will allow you to suddenly, okay, I don't want the cult anymore, I want the city in itself, so you can summon an army there to fight it. Now, in terms of what we were talking about, the seductive influence, that is used in the diplomacy. So. Basically, the more seductive influence with the, the specific faction, the more they will be keen to have some curious to you, towards you, of course, and then they will offer to vessel, basically. At one point, uh, they can be eventually forced into vassalage, of course, as you can see there. You know, these are the, the points where it happens, and you can see that uh, when it's enraptured, it is vulnerable to forced vassalization. And of course, the diplomatic relations are so high that they won't, they won't have any any issue being vassaled by you. So, in general, the mechanics work as in you dominate the full map, but most of the time you'll have a lot of vassals. So not only you'll conquer them, but you'll also vassal them, turn them into your uh, followers, basically. So for province it it it, it gives you Slanesh corruption, both in the same province and adjacent. You can get control, less chance of a plague spreading, and less campaign movement range for the uh, enemy. You also have construction cost and more income from ball buildings, so a more income based one. And you also have proliferate cults cost minus two percent and growth plus fifteen. So note that the proliferate cults, of course, it is world faction wide. So at one point the 
you will be very, very much almost free, which is excellent as well. But of course, at that point, it means that you already have a lot of uh, the provinces. So yeah, that's it. Now, in terms of army stances, let me check Nakari here. You do have kind of like the basic ones. So magic winds of magic power reserve. Now this is useful for Nakari, of course, and for uh, other Slavesh because they do rely a lot of magic as well. We do have in-camp and raid at 50%. Uh, they do generate devotees based on the army of the, uh, the size army, local income and control, so this is important to that. And then we have march. That's basically it. You also have ambush, of course, at 25%. So it's good ones to have some variety, but uh, uh, in, in essence, uh, I would love a little bit more of reform here on the units, uh, on the army stances for almost all demon factions, really. Speaking of buildings, your province capitals can have one of two buildings. One giving half construction uh, cost for military recruitment buildings, and the other one giving half construction cost for infrastructure buildings. Sorry, this one is minus 25%, not half. My apologies. It does have minus 25% recruitment cost. So one is focused on the military, the other one on infrastructure. That's it. Now, um, you have six military buildings, uh, four of which in the capital is still quite good. You know, the fact that you can get these units without being in the capital in a minor settlement is always excellent. Now, tier three units are quite decent. They allow some good combinations. So, of course, you have all the Forsaken and, and the Voter Marauders units. But you also have the Exalted Demonets of Slanesh, you also have the Spawn of Slanesh, you have the Seekers of Slanesh and, you know, other Light Cavalry and Flyers. You have some Chariots, we have the Chaos Warriors. So, in essence, you can do some armies just with a Tier 3. What I mean by that, uh, typically on these videos, what I mean by that is how necessary it is for you to upgrade until, until the Tier 4 and 5, so... In terms of Slanesh, they can handle themselves. Now, for infrastructure, you have the income and growth building. And then we have the growth and casualty replenishment rate. I was just checking something here. Okay. Nothing. And we have the income generated building. Do note when control is below minus 50 or income. So they love when everyone is angry. <laughs> and then we have a jack of all trades, like I like to say. Proliferate. Proliferate cults cost, hero recruitment, it's nice, control and more corruption, it's always nice. Now there are some effects when control is at a specific level like you see, so you should be mindful of that by the way. Research has some interesting stuff. Basically they're mostly campaign buffs, okay, but they're quite interesting because, you know, proliferate cults Minus 25%, that's a lot, that's a huge buff. So when you do get those uh, the, that research, it makes a, an impact on your overall campaign for certain. Most of them are mechanics improvements, but there's still some minor buffs given to some units. So let me see if I can find one. Yeah, 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 and some buffs here to against corn, for instance. So that is always a decent idea, you know? You shouldn't... Uh, uh, you shouldn't avoid research, you should check out what you can get, because of course some of them will change how you fight. Not the best in that regard, by all means, but still quite an interesting tech tree. As always, you have your legendary lord or lord specific skills here for Nakari, uh, your caster and your uh, yellow line for combat, exactly, and you have the red line for your army and the blue line for your campaign options or skills. Starting with the blue line, it does have replenishment, like I like to mention as well. It is added to the seduced unit's budget, which is also cool. Uh, but it doesn't have, uh, not all of them actually have upkeep. This one has, but not all of them have the upkeep in their blue line. There are differences, slight differences. Now there are mainly two options for the army. One is for the mortals, and the other one is into demons, basically. You can mix it up, but it is expensive in terms of... They, they basically fulfill the same roles. So it is expensive for you to have that and to, to buff everything in the red line. 
you rely a lot of magic and you have almost no missiles or flying units which to deal with massive uh, flyers it's rather difficult so in terms of the heroes you actually have let me show you actually have both the chaos sorcerer of slanesh of slanesh and shadows and you also have the illress of shadow and slanesh neither of which gives replenish which is kind of iffy there so here's the red line skills for heralds basically as you can see how speed and uh, charge uh, bonuses are what quite shows in the overall scheme of things. Well, nearly everyone has at least one or the other. Now, in terms of the Chaos Lord tree, has a bit more generalized uh, skill. So some armor, some melee defense, uh, dropping bow out in, in many of the cases. So it, it helps to balance out their already high offensive stats. Now, Nakari is a beast of a one-man army alone, but nothing wrong with giving him some tough mortal infantry with some mobile forces and single entities like you see here, or just some demonettes and uh, some single entities as well. You can notice the skill points allocation, it's pretty average, it's on the average actually, what I consider 15 is average, but yeah, nothing too out of the ordinary, not, it, it could be 11, it could be something less, but well, 15, that's what you get. The heralds can always go into a similar approach, but in this case I put on just a chariot focused or a monster infantry with some missile cap focus. Again, notice how expensive that is. Now, in terms of their Chaos Lords, specifically they buff Chaos Warriors, Chaos Knights and Chosen units, and overall the charge bonuses of the, the army. So, it makes sense to use those units plus some someone that can charge some cavalry, some chariots to benefit from all these buffs. Some single entities too. I always like to include those, uh, especially something anti-large, something anti-infantry, and yep, yeah, uh, you can notice as well the uh, the skill levels. This one much more effective in, in question. So yeah, this would probably be one of the uh, the the armies that I would consider like a staple for the campaign. As a final note, a unique way of playing, focused much more on diplomacy, focused much more on alliances and vassals, and of course in battle in fast-moving units. It is most, the most likely candidate to actually create chaos in the midst of the Order Tide or the Evil Tide, leaving it ripe for conquest. Befriend one, everyone hates it, and then you betray that one, so the possibilities are nearly endless. The army feels quite responsive given how fast it is. Speaking of the army, they have great infantry, good cavalry, great chariots, good single entities, but almost no flyers and almost no missiles. Note to adding to all of this, very fast everywhere. Replenishment is good, it is improved, has improved for immortal empires, but climate is important to note as well for it. Uh, and it does lack a replenishment hero, which would be excellent. I believe it is now time to play with Nakari of Slanesh.